The Wildcats are back on track after they get a 41-15 victory over Cincinnati on Senior Day in Manhattan. K-State started the game off cutting it loose with Avery Johnson's legs. First play of the game was a big run. The Wildcats scored on their first possession of the game and never really looked back after that. It K-State was already up 20 by the time Cincinnati scored for the first time. The game never felt close, and the Wildcats in the third quarter were really just playing to salt things away, very similar to how Arizona State played K-State to start the second half last week. I'm Mason Voth. That's Drew Galloway. K-State back in the win column. Avery Johnson said after the game, yeah, it was big to get the win. I mean, it feels like we haven't done it in a month, and that's close to true. I mean, it was, what, October 29th? When they played October 26th, when they played Kansas and got a win, because then the next week a road loss at Houston, the bye week, and then last week the disappointing loss at home to Arizona State. But now the Cats are back on track, and they have a slim chance of playing for a Big 12 title still available to them. And there's a good chance that by the time the game kicks off next week, because it will be a night kick in Ames, Iowa, for K State and Iowa State, that K State will know. Okay, we win, we're in. If not, doesn't matter, and maybe a win doesn't even matter for those two teams next week, depending on what happens elsewhere throughout the league. But nonetheless, should be fascinating. Now K-State can feel like they have momentum. And the place we have to start tonight is the offense. It was the biggest thing that's been talked about the last two weeks, and really going back a little bit before that, because they struggled to run the ball against KU outside of a couple chunk plays. They didn't run the ball well against West Virginia. It really hasn't felt like this offense has been firing at 100% since the game in Boulder. And K-State tonight came out, different strategy. Connor Riley was on the sidelines tonight instead of up in the booth. So instead, Brian LePac and Clint Brown were up in the booth kind of feeding it down the field. So both Riley and Wells on the field for K-State and the offensive coaching staff. Do you think the changes had that big of an impact, or was this a matter of playing just a bad football team in Cincinnati? I think that it, it can be both because I, I think that – there was a, a chance that this game could have gone not the other way and like Cincinnati blows K-State out, but kind of the, the give-a-damn factor. And that was one of the biggest factors coming in, I think, was going to be how hard was K-State going to play. And, and they answered the bell right away. And, and part of that was with how K-State's offense played and specifically the offensive line. And, and K-State's offensive line has been challenged the last few weeks. Now that Connor Riley's on the field and, and probably has more of a feel of like what's going on with the offensive line down there. So I think that it helps. It also helps that there was a couple portions of the game where it looked like Cincinnati looked like they wanted to be anywhere else but on a football field. But I think that you saw K-State really get into a rhythm, and we've talked really since the KU game. When you can run the ball, football is a pretty easy game because there's so much that you can do off of play action and the RPO game and – so much creativity that you can have in the run game, and we saw the creativity come back in the K-State run game tonight. And when they were able to run for seven yards a carry, it looks like everything is better and looks just a lot more crisp. And even like looking ahead to next week, Iowa State's rush defense hasn't been great in the last handful of games either. Yeah, No, that's that's for sure. And they made a lot of mistakes tonight in their win against Utah that very easily could have led to them losing a game like K-State did to Houston. And it wasn't pouring rain in Salt Lake City tonight. It was clear skies and everything. So that will be something to monitor moving forward with K-State, Iowa State next week. But it did feel like the offense was in a better spot. Avery Johnson kind of alluded to after the game. Felt like this is the healthiest he's been since going into the Colorado game, so maybe that contributed to some of it. He hits double-digit carries tonight, so his presence in the run game no doubt helped. But it's clear to see that the offensive line, for some reason, was better tonight. DJ Giddens, that was a normal DJ Giddens game prior to what really happened against Houston. The yardage was there, went for a big night on just 15 carries. Joe Jackson was good when he got a chance to run the football as well. So it felt like this was the K-State we saw for most of the season because the defense also deserves credit where they weren't perfect tonight and Cincinnati gave them some breaks, but also this was more of the, hey, we're going to bend a decent amount at times, but we're never going to break, and the defense was able to do that tonight. And a lot of that should probably be credited back to the offense for not giving them a ton of short fields like we'd seen in recent weeks. Yeah, this was the first time that K-State has won a field position game in a long time. And it's something that hasn't really been harped on a ton all season, but K-State is one of the worst teams in terms of starting field position 
for their offense and for their defense. So being able to really swing that in K-State's favor tonight also helps a lot. It also can be a little bit lucky in terms of starting field position because, you know, Brendan Mott getting tackled at the six-yard line instead of running it in also kind of really overinflates how drastic the starting field position was. But K-State really dominated in that area. And the offense was clicking. The defense was able to get off the field. I think Cincinnati turned it over on downs four times in the game uh, and three times in the first 34 minutes. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, if Scott Satterfield had some players that seemed like maybe they didn't want to be here and that they had quit, Scott Satterfield sure had not quit on this game. He was calling timeouts. He was going for it nonstop. Uh, he was trying to make it happen, and it really just led to continuously giving K-State the ball in really nice situations. One thing that gave K-State the ball in a really nice situation was before the end of the first half, Cincinnati picks up what would be the first down, but you knew it was coming back because of a holding penalty. So it's third and 18. There's, what, less than 30 seconds left maybe in the half. And Brendan Soresby steps back. Brendan Mott is coming off of the left side and disengages a little bit as Soresby's trying to dump off a screen pass, and Brendan Mott comes away with the first interception of his career. <laughs> Almost took it back, but Soresby caught him. And a couple plays later, Avery Johnson found Trey Spivey. First off, what a play by Brennan Mott, and then what we can get into uh, Trey Spivey and some of the other guys getting some action tonight. Yeah, that, that's a big-time play for Brennan Mott, who has had one of the best seasons of a Big 12 defensive lineman all season. Like He is a legitimate Probably they don't do finals. Did, did the did the pick solidify him as Big Twelve off or defensive lineman of the year? It probably should. I mean that that's as good of a play as you're going to see from a defensive lineman. Uh, it is funny that it was Soresby that caught him. Uh, you know we're Royals people. This is, feels like a Ryan Lefevre Rex Hudler set that they love to have. I would love to know a Brendan to Brendan interception. Oh. How many times that that has happened? Yeah, it's that's probably less rare than a Brendan to Brendan. <laughs> But we'll we'll have to get uh, the the research team on that one. Uh, Trey Spivey then followed it up with a touchdown catch. After that, we saw him a little bit more last week, and he had a rough first series uh, or a second series when uh, he dropped a pass and kind of ran a, a route wrong. But ever since that, it looked really nice. Last week had a nice two point conversion catch, and this week heavily involved, made some big plays, a key fourth and way long pickup, and then also he came through with the touchdown. Yeah, he's going to be a big part of K-State's offense moving forward, not just this year, but for the rest of his tenure. There, there is not a K-State receiver that looks like Trace Bivey because he is all of six foot two, six foot three, and, and 215 pounds and can really go up and get it and make the 50-50 balls. Uh, but you really saw what I think could be can it can it be a breakout if last week was kind of a breakout for him? I think it, last week might have been kind of – it's like you start to see the cracks in the egg, and you're like, oh, the chicks are hatching. This was the full-blown, okay, the egg – the top of the egg has been popped off, and Trace Bivey's here now. Yeah, because it's back-to-back -back games where he has been probably K-State's best receiver, and, and I think that that is not insignificant. And, and, again, just kind of goes to show – and we talked about this a little bit in the post game uh, while we were waiting for players to cycle in. You really look tonight, and the 2023 K State recruiting class just kept making plays all over the field. Avery, Trace Spivey, Austin Romaine, Joe Jackson, and that, that's just Ryan right. Davis. Yeah, and Ryan Davis was. Ryan Davis was a monster in garbage time. Like, whoever was blocking him for Cincinnati was just letting him go, which was pretty fun to watch. So you really see. All those young players, and you're like, okay, this is a good player, not just for these next however many games, because we still don't know what is going to go on next week, because chaos ensued in the Big 12 this week, and K-State still has a shot to make it to Arlington, and now went from 8% to start the day to up to 15% now. Uh, but for however many of these games that are left, you, it's fun to see these retro freshmen and true sophomores really start to take a step. Yeah, no doubt about it. All right, we'll take a break, and when we come back, we'll look ahead to next week's matchup with the Cyclones. Reminder, give the gift of Ireland this holiday season. Secure your tickets now through travel and hospitality packages as the Wildcats kick off the 2025 season in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic in Dublin, Ireland. Visit Cats2Ireland.com for more information. That's Cats, the number two, Ireland.com. Fitting to talk about 
Iowa State because that's where K-State heads next. They will go to Ames to close out the regular season. It seems like there's been a lot of these games against Iowa State at the end of the season under Chris Klein in year one. They beat Iowa State in 2019 here in Manhattan. Last year, obviously, everybody remembers the finale. 2018, Bill yeah. Snyder's last game was in Ames. Uh, to close out the regular season. So there's been a lot of late-in-the-year games between these two teams. Both teams next week mathematically still alive for the Big 12 championship game. What's the expectation for K-State going into it? Because K-State no doubt played better tonight against Cincinnati. But there is an element to it. Cincinnati had lost three straight coming into this. Their problems were greater than what K-State's were. Cincinnati had also done it against teams that were not as good as Arizona State. Arizona State's likely playing for the Big 12 title next week. I don't think West Virginia is going to be doing that. So wh where should pay people have their optimism placed with this team heading to Ames next week against a team that Chris Kleiman's 2-3 and three against? Yeah, I, hope that, I think that the expectation is probably that you would hope that this is something that they can build on the rest of the way. I, I know that there is a scenario out there where K-State knows their fate on if they can go to Arlington or not. And that's kind of similar to how last year's game against Iowa State went, to, to be honest with you. And we, we kind of saw how that went. Uh, but the, the hope is that you can build off of this performance tonight and you kind of just go forward with it. Because there, there was a lot of positives tonight. And obviously, like, number one starts on the scoreboard. But you also saw the flashes from Trace Five. You saw Avery Johnson looking more healthy. And then you saw him running more. You saw DJ Giddens looking as healthy as he has been really in a, in a really long time uh, and that's something that we didn't really talk about uh, during uh, the Cincinnati breakdown but you would hope that it's something that they can really build on and it's something like tangible that can go forward for this game coming up against Iowa State. Yeah it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out now we're recording this at night the Big 12 said that they will release their full final week scenarios uh, on Sunday morning or sometime Sunday, so be on the lookout for that. And if you're trying b-ball not nothing, my head already hurts. Yeah, if you're trying b-ball not nothing dot net, uh, it's crashed tonight. So that tells you where the mindset of Big 12 fans is going into this thing. I think there's just going to be a couple of key things for K-State. Number one, it's going to be really, really, really cold next week in Ames. 21 degrees is the expected high. It's going to be a night kick. I think what you said, it's supposed to feel like 11 degrees next week. A chance of snow. Beautiful. Uh, great. Because we know that this K-State team has handled extreme elements just fantastically over the last couple of seasons. Um, so that's a little concerning for them. And Iowa State on the road, that's just – they have their flaws. They can go through their dry spells on both offense and defense where you go, man, this team doesn't really have a ton going for them. But they're solid and they're sound in a lot of good areas. And as much as we like to pile on Matt Campbell for kind of being a psycho, he's very clearly good at what he does. So this is not like going on the road to face West Virginia and being like, well, you know, if you a couple things go here or there. Iowa State is a team that can straight up beat K-State. This is not just a game next week where if K-State doesn't beat themselves. So K-State has to go out and actually win the game next week, and that's something that they really haven't had to do since. They had to make it happen against KU, but again, you think about it, KU, they got them to gift a lot of opportunities there. So uh, it's, it's a skill that K-State has to prove that they still have. And I'll be interested to see how they come out. That's going to be a wild environment. Night games, Iowa State, they, those people eat it up. So Avery Johnson has to be ready. How much of the quarterback run game is going to stay in there? And probably the biggest thing to watch going into next week, it was no doubt an improvement having Connor Riley on the field tonight for K-State football. But is it really that big of an improvement, or was it just the right scenario where Cincinnati's not a great team, you needed to play better, you were due to play better, and now next week will be the real test of how this plays out. So what are your expectations for mainly the K-State offense? Because I think the K-State defense, you look at it, I don't think Will Lee is going to be shoving guys for 40 yards in the end zone uh, next week. I think this defense will be a little bit better, although they got a couple receivers that can be scary uh, with this K-State secondary. But the run game, Iowa State struggled with it throughout the year. K-State's been great at stopping it. They were great tonight. Corey Connor just never even had a chance to do much. Um, but the offense is the number one focus. Yeah, I'd say that my expectation would be that you would hope that this has been, like, 
K-State finding their groove back, especially running the football, because they they ran the ball extremely well tonight and hadn't in the past few games, and that they can really take advantage of the quick game and the passing game, because that was another thing that was kind of a wrinkle in how K-State attacked through the air, was that it seemed like they were getting the ball out of Avery Johnson's hands in a hurry and had him go on what I had saw, what I kind of tongue-in-cheek said was the, the best trick play K-State had had uh, in our lifetime. Uh, they also saw a delayed rollout where it, it was a design delayed rollout. He just took a little bit to go out and then throw it. Uh, but I, I think that you would want to see more improvement and kind of seeing where how this game can really impact the rest of the way. Uh, I'll give one key for next Saturday before before we head out of here. Uh, special teams. Whoever wins special teams probably wins the game. K-State special teams has not been great or even really good most of the season. Uh, Iowa State, though, tonight had a blocked punt go for a touchdown for Utah and missed a field goal. And, that, and they also missed a field goal early in the game uh, that actually did not count because of a penalty on Utah. So if you can win special teams, you're probably going to win the game because the teams are extremely even. Yeah, that's a great point. And it's something to keep in mind for everybody moving forward. So we'll have plenty of Iowa State lead up this coming week on KSO. Also, a lot of post game here in reaction to K-State's win over Cincinnati to close out the home schedule. You also may or may not see us uh, playing football on the field after the game here. Yep, uh, we did indeed get the the long snapping and holding in. Uh, we got they we got him down. I don't know. It's you know it's it's a tough job, um, but we're not paid to do it. But we did it, and it took us a couple tries. Certainly the holds are not good. Those would get us blasted by. I mean, uh, Sean Snyder might shoot us for how those looked. But uh, we'll, we'll have those up at some point, too, and then everything else that goes with it. Plus, K-State basketball back in action uh, on Sunday, 7 o'clock, as they play in the semifinals of the Paradise Jam against, uh, you know, a pretty good and interesting Liberty team that they're going to see. So, a lot to go this week as uh, Thanksgiving week commences, and it will all end with a very cold and dicey game for the Cats on the road in Ames taking on Iowa State. But that will do it for us tonight. For Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Voth. Thank you for watching and listening to K-State Online. We will talk to you again probably tomorrow. Uh, I'm sure we'll have some basketball thoughts. Uh, no full Sunday show. Jimmy, you guys know him as KSU underscore fan. He's on the road to Colorado. He left with like, I don't know, 12 minutes left in the game. I came up. Now, I should say, I obviously felt that it was garbage time because I came up from the field, and I saw him with his backpack walking towards me. I was like, oh, garbage time. That man's out of here. So he knows how to beat the traffic, uh, and he is beating it all the way out. The uh, and He's just going to not go through Junction City. He's going to fly past it on I-70, and I keep going towards Colorado. So uh, we'll get his thoughts at some point leading up to the Iowa State game and uh, plenty of other stuff going on at KSO right now as well. So we're out of here. We've rambled, and – I don't know. Well, we'll just Buy we'll probably not better. we'll probably not be on the field next week doing this uh, in Ames. I would guarantee you that.